Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first session in a series of information sessions for anyone interested in getting a license, a marijuana license in Denver as a social equity applicant. My name is Abby Borchers. I'm a policy analyst with Denver's Department of Excise and Licenses. Um, the Department of Excise and Licenses issues many different types of licenses, um, including marijuana business licenses. So today's session will be an introduction to Denver's new marijuana social equity program and an introduction to the marijuana licensing process. And our friends from Denver's Office of Economic Development and Opportunity have joined us and will be sharing some resources um, to help you learn more about the basics of starting a business in Denver. Um, we do ask that you save all questions until the end of our presentation. Um, and when you're ready to ask a question during the Q&A period, just use the raise your hand feature and we'll call on you to speak. Um, if you have very specific questions about your particular business model, we may suggest just connecting offline with myself or with Joey Pena, who will introduce himself in a moment, um, just to make sure that we're respecting everybody's time and answering questions that are broadly applicable. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let my colleague Joey Pena introduce himself as well. Joey and I will be taking turns going through the presentation so you don't get too bored listening to either one of us talk. And um, we're also both available to be resources to you going forward if you want to connect offline and talk more about the process or answer any questions. So Joey, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Joey Pena. I'm a cannabis process navigator for the Department of Excise and Licenses. I see a lot of familiar names and faces, so it's glad I'm, I'm glad to see everyone here today um, and everyone connecting. I think we have some, um, some good information to share tonight and know that um, just over the next weeks, over the next few weeks and months, um, we're going to be continuing to do this kind of programming so we can share more valuable information with you. Great. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Excuse my dog. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to kick us off by talking about a couple of bills that were passed by City Council on April 19th and then signed by the mayor on April 20th. Um, the first is the Marijuana Omnibus Bill, which is a comprehensive set of changes to Denver's Marijuana Code. This bill removed the numerical cap on store and cultivation licenses, uh, meaning there's no longer a limited number of those licenses available. This bill also reserves most of the marijuana license types that we offer exclusively for social equity applicants. And finally, this bill adopts a marijuana delivery permit and creates a framework for home delivery of marijuana in Denver. The second bill is the Marijuana Hospitality Bill, which addresses social consumption of marijuana in Denver by adopting a marijuana hospitality program to allow for licensed marijuana consumption businesses. So now that these bills have passed, uh, we are in the implementation phase. So that's kind of marked by the red, we are here. Um, you can see from this graphic, all the stages of developing this policy from uh, policy analysis, outreach, ordinance drafting, and then going through the entire legislative process. Um, we're now in the implementation phase. So this is the stage where we update our forms and processes, train our staff on the new processes, and do education and outreach to stakeholders, just like we're doing today, um, to inform them of the changes before we start accepting applications and issuing licenses. The implementation phase can take a few months, um, and we be expect to begin accepting applications for uh, all licenses except for hospitality licenses sometime in June. Um, hospitality licenses will require a little bit more implementation work, so we likely won't begin accepting those until later this year. So I'm going to turn it over to Joey to talk about how you can qualify as a social equity applicant and then what opportunities are available to social equity applicants. 
Yeah, so as Abby mentioned, um, our new code provides license exclusivity for most of our marijuana license types for social equity applicants. So here we can we can look and see who qualifies as a social equity applicant um, at an extremely high level. It's Colorado residents who have never had a marijuana license revoked and who meet one of three social equity criteria so um, the three criteria that an applicant must meet one of, um, the applicant resided in an opportunity zone or a disproportionate impacted area for at least 15 years between 1980 and 2010, or the applicant or an immediate family member was arrested, convicted, or suffered civil asset forfeiture due to a marijuana offense, or the applicant's household income did not exceed 50% of the state median income as measured by the number of people who reside in the applicant's household. And I believe that's the year prior to application. And then the social equity applicant must own at least 51 of the marijuana, 51% um, of the marijuana license that's being granted. And in Denver, any license granted to a social equity applicant must be majority owned by a social equity applicant uh, until 2027. Um, for more information about um, the eligibility criteria or how to qualify as a social equity applicant, um, we recommend visiting the Marijuana Enforcement Division social equity website. Um, the state will be conducting the finding of suitability for social equity applicants and Denver's definition for a social equity applicant aligns with the state's. Opportunities for social equity applicants. Um, Abby mentioned that as a part of our new code, licensing exclusivity is provided. What that means is that social equity applicants have exclusive access to the following licenses until July of 2027. Um, these are for stores, for transporters, for cultivations, for manufacturing facilities, and for hospitality, mobile hospitality, and hospitality and sales businesses. Um, delivery exclusivity is another feature that's um, for social equity applicants. There's a period of exclusivity. So only transporters who qualify as social equity applicants will be granted transporter delivery permits until July 1 of 2024. And stores will be required to use transporters to conduct deliveries until July 1st of 2024. In addition to that, um, we have waived or reduced application or licensing fees for most or all of our marijuana license types. Okay, thanks Joey. Um, now that we've covered what the social equity program looks like, let's dive into the process of getting a license or a permit. So I want to start by noting that while we at Excise and Licenses strive to provide our customers with the absolute best customer service possible, we cannot give you legal or business advice or make any preliminary findings regarding an application. Um, it's every applicant's own responsibility to ensure that you comply with all relevant codes, rules, regulations at both the state and local levels. Um, we encourage you to do your own research and investigation and engage the services of any professionals such as attorneys or business consultants um, as you see fit. So marijuana businesses are regulated at both the state and local levels, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, but this slide is just a quick primer on the different government agencies that you are likely to encounter as a marijuana business as well as their acronyms. So on the left side there in the dark blue circles, you can see that's the state of Colorado. Obviously the state of Colorado's government apparatus is much larger than this, but um, these are kind of the agencies that you are likely to encounter as a marijuana licensee. So that includes the Colorado Department of Revenue, which is more commonly CDOR or DOR. Um, and housed within that department is the Marijuana Enforcement Division, which is often called the MED or the MED and the MED issues marijuana licenses and enforces marijuana rules. So that's really the primary one that you would encounter if you haven't already. Um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment or CDPHE is also a state agency. Um, they deal with things like testing of marijuana, um, education around health outcomes and youth protection, um, things like that. Uh, the Colorado Department of Agriculture or the CDA 
deals with things like industrial hemp and pesticides for marijuana cultivation, um, among other things that I'm sure I'm missing. On the right side is the city and county of Denver apparatus in light blue. Um, so highlighted there is the Department of Excise and Licenses. That's where me and Joey work. Um, and that department issues marijuana licenses for the city, um, totally separate from the state process for issuing licenses. We also have uh, the Department of Public Health and Environment or DDPHE, uh, which houses their divisions of environmental quality and public health, uh, which conduct inspections on different license types, different marijuana license types. Community Planning and, and Development or CPD is home to zoning and neighborhood inspections, as well as building. Um, they also do inspections and enforcement for marijuana licenses. And then the Denver Police Department is also known as DPD, um, also does enforcement of marijuana codes. And Denver Fire Department or DFD uh, will also do inspections on some of our licenses and ensure that uh, life safety and fire safety requirements are met. So like I said before, uh, marijuana businesses are regulated by both the state and the city. Um, this means that every marijuana business needs a state license and a Denver license. Denver has its own requirements for all businesses, including marijuana businesses. These include zoning, building, life safety, uh, public health, um, and other requirements that businesses have to meet in order to get a license. So these requirements protect the health and safety of you, your employees, your customers, your neighbors, and that's why excise and licenses won't issue your license until all of those requirements are met and all those inspections are passed. Um, sometimes local regulations differ from state regulations. So Amendment 64 provided for local governments to make their own rules regarding the time, place, and manner in which marijuana businesses are operated. Um, so if a local rule differs from a state rule, the stricter rule applies. So for example, state rules limit the retail value of marijuana in an enclosed delivery vehicle to $10,000 but Denver's limit is $5,000. Since $5,000 is stricter, this is the rule that applies in Denver. Okay, let's talk about the different licenses and permits you might need depending on the type of marijuana business that you want to run. Um, I'll start with a disclaimer that every business is different and that's why you have to do your own research and consult with a trusted professional if you need to, to make sure that you're getting all the licenses and permits that are required to do the activities that you want to do. But this is a general breakdown of what licenses you need to do different activities. Um, also note that the blue stars indicate those licenses that are exclusively available to social equity applicants. So if you want to sell marijuana to consumers, um, you may need a retail marijuana store license. If you want to just um, sell marijuana to people 21 plus, in the quantities listed there on the right. If you want to sell marijuana to consumers and also allow them to consume the marijuana on your licensed premises, you would need a retail marijuana hospitality and sales license. This allows you to sell marijuana to people ages 21 plus in smaller amounts and allow them to consume that on the premises. If you want to operate a licensed premises, which when I say licensed premises, we're talking about the building where your business is operated um, and allow consumers to consume marijuana on the premises, you may want to get a marijuana hospitality license, which um, allows you to operate a premises where consumers 21 plus can bring their own marijuana from home to consume. So no sales are allowed by this license type. Um, you may also want a marijuana hospitality license with a mobile premises. This is similar. It allows you to operate a mobile licensed premises such as a tour bus or a shuttle where consumers can bring their own marijuana to consume, but again, no sales on this model. Um, or you may want a retail marijuana hospitality and sales license, which allows you to operate a premises where consumers can come and purchase small amounts of marijuana and consume it on the premises, but they cannot bring their own marijuana. 
If you would like to transport marijuana from business to business, uh, you would need a retail and or a medical transporter license. Um, this allows you to take business, take marijuana from one marijuana business to another marijuana business. So from a cultivation to a store or from a manufacturing facility to a store. Um, if you want to deliver marijuana to patients and consumers, you would need that transporter license as well as a delivery permit. So if you want to deliver retail and medical marijuana, you would need a retail marijuana transporter license, a medical marijuana transporter license, a retail marijuana delivery permit, and a medical marijuana delivery permit. Um, and then just note that um, the delivery permit doesn't have a star by it because only transporters that qualify as social equity applicants can get a delivery permit, but stores can get a delivery permit regardless of social equity status, but the stores have to contract with the transporters to do their deliveries. So I know this is confusing, so if there's any questions about this piece of it, we can address that more um, during the Q&A session. If you want to grow marijuana, uh, you'll need a retail cultivation facility license. Um, note that the city of Denver does not issue medical cultivation facility licenses anymore. Um, if you would like to produce marijuana concentrate or marijuana products, such as edibles or topicals, um, you would need a retail or medical marijuana products manufacturer license, which is more commonly called a MIP. Um, both the cultivation licenses and the MIP licenses um, do not allow for direct to consumer sales. So those products go to a store to be sold to the consumer or they go to a retail marijuana hospitality and sales establishment to be sold to the consumer. If you would like to conduct research on marijuana, you would need a marijuana research and development license. Um, this allows you to cultivate, manufacture, and possess medical marijuana for limited research purposes um, in furtherance of an approved research project. This one is not exclusive to social equity applicants because we want to make sure that anybody who wants to do research on the medical efficacy of marijuana is able to do so. And then if you want to test marijuana, you would need a retail and or a medical marijuana testing facility license. Um, this just allows you to accept samples of marijuana from licensed marijuana businesses and then perform tests for potency, contaminants, and other required tests. Again, this one is not exclusive to social equity applicants just because of um, the need for a critical mass of testing facilities in order to satisfy market demand and not interrupt the supply chain. Okay. I'm going to kick it back to Joey to talk about fees, the licensing process, and finding a location. As we said at the beginning of our conversation, um, one of the features of the new marijuana code is that we have reduced or waived fees for social equity applicants. So you'll see in the column on the right hand side that the application fee for most of our marijuana license or permit types is waived. And where it's not waived, then for retail marijuana businesses, for example, the first year license fee um, is waived. So we have reduced or waived fees for social equity applicants. The MED has um, a fee schedule for all state fees. So just note that everything that you would see here is a city fee only, and that there are also state fees for any of these corresponding applications. And we're gonna post these slides um, on our website after this. So there will be plenty of opportunity to go back and review. And this is an example licensing process. So I want to start by saying that this is going to, this is going to evolve over time. Um, a part of the reason that my, my role was created with the city was to look at ways to identify process and policy improvements. So this is an example of a licensing process as it would exist today. And some of this, um, some of this changes a bit because obviously every business has a unique situation. Um, and it, it would be difficult to say that 
every step of the way is going to look exactly like this. So um, below is just an example of a, a licensing process for an individual social equity applicant who has never held a marijuana license and is seeking a license for a retail store. So that's, that's a critical to this kind of example because we are gonna talk about hearing requirements at some point in this process. So when you see over on the left-hand side that the applicant, this starts with the applicant applying to the MED for a finding of suitability. That includes the verification of the applicant's social equity eligibility. The approval for that can take up to 120 days, but anecdotally what we've heard is that the MED has been processing these rather quickly and has been doing a really wonderful job at prioritizing applications for findings of suitability for our social equity applicants. Um, they have been really wonderful partners to us in this process and answering our questions. So the applicant will submit that finding of suitability and then they will receive a finding of suitability that designates them as an owner SE license. Um, that is when the owner has been found suitable and has their social equity eligibility. Um, at that point, in general, the applicant can begin to identify a location for their business. In this case, we're talking about a retail store and they ensure that that meets all of Denver's location and zoning requirements um, and at the time of application, we'll have to provide proof that they will possess the premise by the time the license is issued. So that proof of possession of premise would look something like a lease or a deed or a letter of intent. Um, the next step in that process would be that the applicant would submit their new license application to the MED. Uh, state approval for that can take anywhere from 45 to 90 days and the MED during that time is sending a copy of that new license application to Denver Excise and Licenses. Excise and Licenses is reviewing the application to determine whether the applicant is eligible to apply for a marijuana license in Denver. And then we will notify the applicant if they're eligible to submit an application for a Denver marijuana license. The applicant can then submit a completed new license application and pay the required Denver license fees um, at the same time and, and kind of anywhere throughout this process, the applicant can be working through the necessary permitting processes with community planning and development. So that's going to be your zoning use permit, um, your, your building permits, your fire operational permits, anything that may be necessary to become operational can kind of be happening concurrently while you're applying for these license applications. Um, excise and licenses then reviews the application. That initial review can take 30 days or more. Like I said at the beginning of the conversation, this is sort of how we're doing this now, but certainly looking at ways to streamline this and make it move a little bit faster for social equity applicants um, and for our businesses to help um, kind of streamline things and, and get them operational faster. Um, but looking at this, um, this is when we would do a proximity review um, and, and where um, the community, um, um, where community planning and development, um, particularly the, the zoning department is looking at that zoning use application. The, um, the application for a zoning use application can, that process can take about 90 days. Um, so it's, it's good to kind of build that into your processes and be working on that in advance. Um, then, because we're talking primarily about a retail store here, this is when excise and licenses would schedule a public needs and desires hearing. And that's going to be for a store or a hospitality business or a hospitality and sales business only. Um, so if you are applying for a manufacturing facility license or a cultivation license, a transporter license, there wouldn't be that public needs and desires hearing. And we would skip right to the next step where um, you would be issued an inspection notice to begin your inspections. For stores, for hospitality, for hospitality and sales businesses, you have the public needs and desires hearing. After that hearing requirements met, that's when we provide you with an inspection notice so that you can begin calling for those inspections with the fire department, the building department, public health, excise and licenses. And then once all of those are passed, you have your zoning use permit, you've received your state license, that's when we would issue your local license and when you would be able to open for business. So these are just some of our common inspections. Um, 
we're again kind of constantly monitoring our inspections processes and and looking at ways to streamline things. Um, but for now, these are inspections that you could expect if this was the type of business that that you were looking at opening. Um, every applicant has to pass their required inspections to ensure that the business is safe and compliant before we issue a license. Those common inspection requirements, we do have a document that's going to be updated over time. Um, and then we can we also have ways to learn how to schedule those inspections. But in general, what you'll see is that there are quite a few departments where they have a, a real vested interest in um, in um, inspecting each and every one of these these license types and others where there's less of a need for them to be out inspecting. Um, one of those, for example, would be uh, the building department with a mobile hospitality business. If we're talking about just a, a tour bus or a shuttle, um, the building department isn't really out looking at vehicles, but if there was a licensed premise, they may be inspecting at the licensed premise to be sure that it meets all building requirements. Um, so this is just one portion of that. I think there's one more slide with inspections on it. Um, so you look at, these are the um, uh, other license types that we have. Um, for manufacturing and cultivation, you see that um, most of our, our city agencies are out and inspecting, um, and, and that looks a little bit different per license type. And now we're going to talk about finding identifying locations. Um, so just a note on this that all businesses must comply with the Denver Zoning Code for their underlying use. Um, this chart will provide you with information about our proximity restrictions. Um, these are our proximity requirements. So for example, hospitality and hospitality and sales businesses, you'll see in the first column, medical and retail marijuana stores in the second column, and marijuana cultivations in the third column. Um, you'll notice that for hospitality and hospitality and sales, they're required to be a thousand feet away from schools, childcare facilities, city pools and recreation centers, alcohol or drug treatment facilities, and other similar license types. So hospitality and sales, a thousand feet from hospitality and sales businesses. With medical and retail marijuana stores, you'll see that they're a thousand feet from schools, child care facilities, alcohol or drug treatment facilities, and a thousand feet from other existing or from pending stores. And then marijuana cultivations are required to be a thousand feet from residential zone districts and a thousand feet from schools. For stores and for cultivations, you'll also notice that there are requirements um, about neighborhoods of undue concentration. So medical and retail marijuana store licenses cannot be issued in a neighborhood of undue concentration for stores only. And marijuana cultivation facility licenses cannot be issued in a neighborhood of undue concentration for marijuana cultivation facilities only. Um, we will be sharing more information at the end of this week about those neighborhoods of undue concentration. So we are going to talk about this a little bit later in our presentation. It is really critical that everyone is signed up for our industry bulletin so that you're receiving up-to-date information about this. Um, but we will be sharing those neighborhoods of undue concentration. Two more notes on this slide at the bottom. You'll see that um, there are different methods of measuring for certain facility types. Um, and and um, all of this, you'll find more information about when we release a facility guide later this week, which is a good segue, I think, to the next slide, where we do talk about our marijuana facility location guide. We are currently updating that with zoning information um, and information about our proximity restrictions for all of our license types, as well as the neighborhoods of undue concentration where stores and cultivation facilities may not be located. Um, you can also use Google Maps to take a preliminary look at a location. You can measure distance to prohibited locations nearby with Google Maps. Um, it is not going to be 100% accurate, but it may give you a very good idea of some of the obvious non-starters that, that may be within a thousand feet of uh, intended location. Finally, you can contact marijuana info at denvergov.org for a preliminary non-binding proximity check. At this time, while we're waiting to, to release the neighborhoods of undue concentration and while we're working through that implementation phase where we're updating some of our processes, we are not 
con currently conducting preliminary non-binding proximity checks, but we will begin that process again in a few weeks. So you can be reaching out to marijuana info at denvergov.org to request that. Finally, some location tools that may be helpful to you. A list of, pen of pending marijuana applications can be found on the Denver Open Data Catalog. Like Abby said, we're gonna be sharing these slides um, on our website and there's gonna be a recording in this presentation as well. But each of these will be linked to, for example, the Denver Open Data Catalog. So you can look for those pending marijuana applications. There's also a list of proposed applications for medical marijuana center and retail marijuana stores, uh, transfers of location that you can ask for if you email marijuanainfo at denvergov.org. So again, you would just be requesting um, pending transfers of location for marijuana stores um, by emailing us. There is a list of active Denver child care facility licenses that can be found on the Denver Open Data Catalog as well. Um, there is a list of licensed drug and alcohol treatment facilities that can be found on the Colorado Department of Human Services website. You can find the zone districts surrounding a proposed location using the Denver zoning map. We're going to have, once you have access to this, you'll be able to link to that. And then you can identify the neighborhood a proposed location is located in using the Denver neighborhoods map. So that's going to show you the statistical neighborhoods in the city. Okay, um, thank you, Joey. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few notes of caution. Everybody is probably aware of this, but it's worth noting that marijuana remains a Schedule One drug at the federal level, meaning it's federally illegal. Um, so this can pose some unique challenges for marijuana business owners and employees. Um, these can include difficulty accessing capital through traditional means, such as a a traditional bank loan, um, limited options for banking, credit card processing, payroll, and other business services. Um, that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means you might have to search a little bit harder for them. They might have waiting lists, things like that. Um, adverse immigration consequences uh, and potentially difficulty obtaining a mortgage or another personal loan. Um, I also wanna talk about predatory practices. Uh, in other jurisdictions that have marijuana social equity programs, um, we've seen that predatory investors sometimes attempt to exploit social equity applicants in order to obtain a license to protect against predatory practices and maintain the integrity of our social equity program. We require that social equity applicants maintain at least 51% ownership of their license until July 1, 2027, which is the end of that six-year exclusivity period for social equity applicants. Um, social equity applicants may transfer ownership of their license so long as 51% uh, remains under the ownership of one or more social equity applicants. So say you own 51% of a license as a social equity applicant and a non-social equity applicant investor owns the other 49%. And you decide that you want to sell your 51% stake in that business. Um, but we would check the transfer of ownership to ensure that the person who is taking over that ownership percentage or multiple people who are taking over that ownership percentage also qualify as social equity applicants. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to please check that you're muted so we can reduce the background noise. Um, okay. So it's important to protect yourself against predatory investors, business partners, lenders, consultants, anybody who might not have your best interests at heart. Um, and again, we encourage all licensees to consult with legal counsel. Um, and just carefully read all contracts before entering into any agreements. Um, we also just wanted to highlight some red flags to watch out for. So a red flag would be anyone who claims to have inside information or inside access to government processes. State and local laws, rules, and regulations are public information, and comments and inquiries from the public are welcome. Um, if someone is offering to 
send you an application form and then cash a check from you, that application form is free for you to access online. Or you can email us and we'll send you that form for free. So just be sure that if, if there's information about state laws and rules and applications, all that stuff is online and it's free to access. Um, anyone who guarantees you funding without performing due diligence on your company. Legitimate investors and lenders will perform some level of due diligence on your business to understand your business model, any risks, and its potential for success. Um, anyone who guarantees you a license is a red flag. Um, there is no cap on licenses for social equity applicants in Denver. So like I said before, there's no cap on the on store and cultivation locations anymore. And there's not a limited number of licenses of any type available for social equity applicants. So anyone who qualifies as a social equity applicant may apply for a license. Um, all applicants have to meet the requirements for licensure. And that determination is made by the city and by the state, not by any private third parties. Um, another red flag is anyone who tries to pressure you into making a quick decision or tries to discourage you from consulting with an attorney. Um, this is something we saw in markets like Los Angeles where they had um, a time-based lottery system for issuing licenses and people felt that they needed to rush into a quick agreement to get those licenses. That's not the case in Denver. Parties on both sides of the transaction should have the time to perform their due diligence consult with an attorney or another trusted professional and make a decision about entering into that agreement. And then of course, any agreement that would affect your ability to exercise control over the business or share in the revenues and the profits of the business. Again, just reading contracts carefully and consulting with an attorney if you need to. Okay, um, also wanna talk about some additional resources to learn more. Um, at the top there are some Denver resources. So we have a few different web pages that you can explore. Um, I would particularly highlight uh, the Denver Marijuana Licenses webpage that will give you more information about um, how to apply for a license. Uh, the Marijuana Laws, Rules and Regulations page is more about um, the policy development process, uh, getting to where we are with um, these marijuana policies. And then we highly recommend that you subscribe to our Marijuana Industry Informational Bulletin. Um, this is really important. Uh, this is how we distribute all kinds of notices and information, including any additional presentations or workshops like this. And then some state resources to take a look at uh, would be the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division's Regulated Marijuana Rules. Um, MED's Applications and Forms page has all the applications and forms you might need. Um, they also have a social equity web page and some social equity FAQs that might be helpful to you if you're looking to qualify as a social equity applicant. And then subscribe to the Marijuana Enforcement Division's email list. And again, all these slides will be posted online so you can click on all of these links. And then if you have questions about Denver's licensing process, email marijuanainfo at denvergov.org. Um, I know that sometimes a generic email address is not always the most promising thing in terms of getting a response, but I guarantee that me or Joey will see it within 24 hours and, and try to get you a response as quickly as we can. So. Um, if you need help in Spanish, you can email crystal.reyes at denvergov.org. Um, she can get you assistance in Spanish. And then if you have questions about the state's licensing process, uh, the Marijuana Enforcement Division has that inquiry form, which is linked there. Um, and that will direct your inquiry to the appropriate person to answer it. Okay, so... Um, we have a couple folks who are going to present about business support resources. So um, sort of different from the licensing arena, we're going to get into some more business development pieces. Um, first, uh, Truman Bradley is the executive director of the Marijuana Industry Group, and he has offered to present information about How you doing? MIGS. Yeah. 
a business mentorship program. Good. Thank you, Abby. Uh, so if everybody could go ahead. Hey there, Dan. If you mind uh, going on mute, that'd be awesome. Oh. Uh, hey, everybody. Truman Bradley, Executive Director of the Marijuana Industry Group. Thank you to Denver Excise and License for um, the opportunity to speak today, as well as um, for just the overall uh, presentation today. It's extremely helpful, and uh, I'll be reading it again. Um, just wanted to announce uh, uh, MIG's Social Equity Business Mentorship Program. The idea is to, um, to really pair social equity entrepreneurs with established cannabis business executives. Um, as you've probably figured out from this presentation, it's not easy to start a marijuana business. I started two and it was really, really hard and uh, it's only gotten more challenging, but um, we want to be able to help. I've been lucky enough to learn from mentors who helped me along the way in my business career. And that's, the idea here. And so um, it's very simple. Uh, if you're interested, just reach out to the email address that you see on the screen there, admin at marijuanaindustrygroup.org, or just call this phone number that you see below, 720-382-3009. And what this is, what you're signing up for, and, and we've got a limited number of folks who are willing to do this, but the idea is to um, have a commitment where you and a cannabis business executive, we pair you up for six months and you agree to, to meet once a month, either virtually or in person, depending on your level of vaccination and comfort. And, you know, these people will just provide guidance, you know, for whatever questions you may have as you navigate the process, whether it's the licensing, which is sort of being talked about now, or your business plan, or all the million decisions that you're going to be making. Um, and that's really it. So I, I would encourage you to do this. I think it will be something that will be really helpful for you and um, looking forward to meeting you and, and working with you and pairing you up with the right person. So thank you to Excise and License. Thank you so much, Truman. This sounds like a fantastic program. And I think that uh, mentorship from experienced cannabis industry executives is going to be really valuable to social equity applicants. So excited to see uh, people participate. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let uh, our friends at Dido um, pick up the presentation from here. Michael, are you on? Great. <clears throat> All right, can everybody hear me? Sorry, I started sharing my screen before I uh, unmuted myself. <laughs> I couldn't find the mute button. Um, Thanks for the, the presentations, pretty thorough um, a process of walking everybody through this process. And Truman, kudos to you for stepping up and, and offering the mentorship piece of it, because that's certainly one of the biggest pillars uh, for success um, is being able to be paired up with a mentor, especially with somebody with industry expertise and in what you're trying to create. So my name is Michael Beavis. I'm with the Office of Economic Development and Opportunity. I'm the Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for the city. So what I do all day, every day, I have the great pleasure of teaching people how to create and grow and scale businesses. So any industry, any, in any sector. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through a very high level overview of some of the resources that our offices, our office provides, uh, mostly all free of charge. And um, I, just, I just want you to be aware of some of the things there and how to get in touch with us when you're ready to kind of explore and move your business forward. So uh, this is a, a, a presentation that we talk about. So I oversee uh, an entity that we call the Commons on Champa. So it's a public-private partnership agreement between the city of Denver and the downtown Denver partnership. And it's basically free co-working space. So you can come in, use free Wi-Fi, get free coffee, free programming, uh, a ton, a ton of resources in there. And we still, um, even though we've kind of been shut down as a result of COVID, we're still offering all the services that we typically run out of that facility 
uh, in a virtual capacity. So I'd highly encourage you to get kind of plugged into what we do there. This is Carrie Singer. She's one of my colleagues in the Office of Economic Development and Opportunity. And you'll see her face around there and or behind the scenes with a, a lot of the programming that we offer there. And so here, here in the colored slides area, you see a lot about what our group does. It's kind of broken down into a handful of different groups. So uh, business development is the area that I'm, I'm concentrated on, which is primarily focused on business attraction and retention. So again, we want to connect you to the resources that you need in order to be successful and grow and build a thriving business here in Denver. Um, so these are some, some just, uh, again, very high level overview of resources that are available through our office. So we can help you with the business planning process. Um, we can, from a full-blown business plan to a lean canvas model to, you know, just, just key topics and subject matter expertise on how you're going to market this business once you build it um, and grow it and scale it and get customers. We can connect you to a lot of the legal resources and or, um, mentorships or consulting groups that uh, Abby was talking about earlier to help you kind of make sure that you're going down the right path with how you're building your business. So we refer to the Commons on Champa. We say, if you're starting up, you start here. Um, and the idea is that we can get, then kind of get you plugged into all the resources that you need in order to you know, move, move successfully through the, the industry sector that you're doing. Um, so again, here we talk a little bit about financing and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, so we have these toolkits here. We have toolkits in a variety of different languages. We can get them customized in other languages um, if that's something that you need on there. One of the most valuable things that we offer there is one-on-one -on -one business advising or something that we call advisory hours. So you can simply go online and you can book up to an hour time, again, free of charge with a subject matter expert from our office in a particular industry sector, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and uh, and, with, and then again, we can, we can point you in another direction for some additional advisory support outside of our office if that's, uh, if that's what makes sense for you. One of the things that we help support with is things like workforce, like how are you going to hire and train and build uh, staff that you need to run a successful business in that, in that space. And we have a ton of uh, additional resources and support for uh, women, minority-owned businesses, um, and just businesses that are kind of being built up and, and grown in key areas of, of Denver where we wanna see some growth and, and opportunities there. I run a program called Scale Up. Uh, Scale Up is what I refer to as a post accelerator program. So typically work with CEOs and founders of companies that are, they typically have raised some money. They typically are generating revenue about two to $3 million or less. And they're just looking on how we break into kind of middle market territory. So 10, 20, 50 million categories. So the point here is that we have the resources to help you at any stage of what your business is at. Um, and then we have some global efforts here as well uh, for businesses that are looking to expand outside of the Denver area. So we do offer some financing programs and some micro loan programs. This is not something that we would be able to offer for this particular industry sector because a lot of the funding that comes from this program comes from federal dollars. So as Abby was talking about earlier with some of the restrictions and while the state and the local governments are in support of this industry, federal uh, governments are not yet there. Um, but there are opportunities and I do have a, a long list of resources that are providing funding in this particular area and some banking resources as well. So again, we'll just get you plugged in to where those uh, resources exist. I would imagine that uh, Truman's resources as well have some good experience in, the, in this area as well. Um, okay, so uh, again, Commons on Champa. So we're located in downtown, right on the corner, kind of a 14th and Champa. So it's kind of right across the street from the convention center. Uh, again, typically prior to COVID, we we're open um, eight to five, Monday through Friday kind of thing. And you could walk in and again, participate in advisory hours. Uh, which you'll see some, some pictures here, as well as programming. So we offer programming out of there, something called co-starters as an example, which is a nine week long uh, early stage kind of pre-accelerator program uh, for businesses that are you know, just starting up. They need help writing a business plan. They, they need help communicating their message, identifying their target audience, et cetera. And so while this is an industry 
as an example, the marijuana industry is starting to become obviously a flourishing business uh, in the state of Colorado. And there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of ways to position yourself so that you can still capitalize on all the, the potential that's there in the industry. So we have permanent offices up on the second floor, uh, Carrie and I do, and we're typically there on a regular basis. But again, in COVID times, we're doing everything virtually and you're certainly welcome to reach out to us directly and talk about this. So this is a list. Again, I don't, I, I don't want to bore you with the list, but this is just, again, a very high level overview of only a small portion of what we offer um, in the way of helping support businesses as they grow and scale throughout that. Uh, a colleague of mine, Joanne, if she's not on the call today, she will be with us again on Thursday. Um, she has some additional resources that she works with small businesses in the area as well. Again, just kind of what we would refer to as kind of wraparound services to make sure that you are supported um, and you're able to access the information that you need in order to be successful. As you can tell from the presentation, it's quite daunting um, and there's a lot of steps in the process and we wanna be here to help you navigate that process is really what it comes down to. Um, again, these are some of our partners that we work with um, in support of that. Many of these partners on this slide are in support of the marijuana industry and can offer some additional support where you're gonna run into some, some of those exceptions here in the lending institutions, because again, a lot of them are supported by federal dollars. Um, but again, we have resources available um, that, that can connect for you for, for financing opportunities there. Just some pictures of the space when there's people in it, we have conference rooms. Um, we have a large event space where you have the opportunity to, you know, host a, a launch party or a kickoff event or educational sessions. So you'll see us um, put on a lot of sessions in here. We do something that we call power hours or kind of like a lunch and learn concept. So we can, and you can just go online and see what the schedule is like. And the schedule typically will, you know, cover topics like things from like marketing 101 to like how to build a website to, you know, how to set up distribution channels, again, some high level overview of legal advice and allow for a lot of opportunity for kind of Q and A throughout that process. Okay. Again, as I mentioned here, um, these, are, these are the typical hours, but, and we are still doing stuff virtually and offering a lot of those programs and the resources that I mentioned. These are some of the industry expertise that our staff directly can provide uh, information and content on there. And obviously, again, I, I specialize in just general business. Uh, I've been teaching and coaching entrepreneurs for the better part of 20 plus years. I am an entrepreneur myself um, and, and currently building a scaling business. So I have a lot of, you know, I like to practice what I preach. So I like to say, so um, we can help you in this area. Um, and then again, these are our contact information. Um, and we can share these slides. This is being recorded, so you can come back and look here. And my direct contact information here includes my cell phone and my direct email address. Great, thank you so much, Michael. That's really fantastic information. So um, I wanna now open it up for questions. Um, our friends from the Marijuana Enforcement Division are here as well in case you have questions that are more applicable to state processes, but Joey and I can address uh, questions related to city processes. Um, so if you are interested in asking a question, um, it would really be helpful to us if when you introduce yourself, just say your name and maybe describe what kind of business, if you want to describe what kind of business you might be interested in opening. We wanna sort of start to get a sense of what license types people are most interested in and what kind of other sessions we can start to think about for folks. So if you're comfortable sharing the type of license you're interested in, please do, we'd like to know. So looks like Blaze Bradford has his hand up if you'd like to ask your question. Hey, how you doing? Um, I, uh, Blaze Bradford, um, I'm interested in a uh, retail uh, marijuana location. I'm trying to understand the undue um, locations in the area where they actually want the dispensary at. So that's, that's kind of what I'm kind of confused about on where they want the dispensary located. So the 
neighborhood of undue concentration for stores, um, there, there will be five neighborhoods that are determined to have the most marijuana location, more marijuana store location in Denver. And those would be the top five concentrated neighborhoods. Um, if there's a tie for fifth place, all of the tied neighborhoods are included. Um, so those five neighborhoods, the ones that are the top five neighborhoods of undue concentration for stores are neighborhoods where new store locations cannot go. Does, I don't know if you have an additional, does that answer your question? No, that, 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 that's perfect. That, that answers the question perfect. Okay, great. Um, Sean Luna. Hello, uh, how you doing? Um, let me see, uh, sorry about that, thank you. So again, um, thank you for having me on, I uh, appreciate that. I am trying to go after the delivery, uh, delivery part to get the foot in the door. And I believe it was Joey explained to me um, that after, once you're in, if able to get in that way, that um, how long after you pass, I guess, in June 2nd, what is that date? Is that the, is that the start of when uh, dispensaries are able to start their deliveries? So sometime in June, we'll be making applications available for delivery permits. But by okay. law, we're not able to issue a delivery permit until July 1st. So the okay. goal is that we would make applications for delivery permits and for new transporters. So for example, if you're interested in applying for your retail and medical transporter licenses, you our goal would be that we would have those applications available in June, that you would be able to apply for your retail and medical marijuana transporter licenses and delivery permit at the same time. And then after July 1st, we would actually be able to issue delivery permits. So you would kind of go through steps in that, um, that licensing process that we had outlined. Um, so if there are any required inspections, you would have to complete those. We would just walk through that process to, to get through your application before we do a permit. So applying, there's going to be a period of time between application and issuance. Um, a, a permit or a, a license wouldn't be issued immediately. No, that's what my, that's what my question was going through was, after all that process, so the, you know, let's say a three or four, five month timeline between the dispensary can actually start delivering. For existing dispensaries, the process is is likely going to be much easier to receive a delivery permit because they're not going to be applying for a new business license. So what the goal would be is that the that existing dispensaries would be able to apply for a delivery permit and have that delivery permit very quickly after July 1st, so that when our first transporters are licensed and able to begin making deliveries, they can partner with those stores to conduct deliveries from there on. So by the end of the summer kind of deal? I think I think it's there's there's a very real possibility that we could be issuing those delivery permits and seeing our first deliveries by the end of the summer. Okay, yeah, because I was I was asking that because of the ninety day process, whatever, of what Joey explained. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Excuse me. Okay. Hey, uh, looks like Mark have your hand up next. How do I do that? Oh, she's just... <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you in the queue. All right. Um, hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, my name is Mark Steimer. I own currently four licenses um, in this, excuse me, in the city of Denver. And I've been approached by a social equity applicant to be their partner on a venture um, to basically build, design, and obtain licenses for the program. <clears throat> uh, and I, and I, I spoke with Joey. Uh, hi, Joey, by the way. I spoke with Joey a couple times just trying to get some answers to the uh, undue concentration zip codes. I know we're, we're hoping maybe we can get that by Friday or so this week. We're hoping. It'd be nice. Um, 
<clears throat> but I do have a, I have a question. I know I, I have a pretty good idea about which ones are going to be blocked, so to say. Um, <clears throat> and I have a, a potential for a piece of property that I would basically be building a new building on. So it's a, so the, one of my dilemmas here is, is currently today, after all of my due diligence and research in this area, there are no schools within the thousand foot rule. Uh, there, there's no daycares, there's no reps, uh, pools, et cetera, right? So it, it, it checks all the boxes. So I go purchase this piece of land and I start my build. What assurances do I have by the time I get to that process what if somebody opens a daycare 800 feet from my facility? And I don't, here I am investing millions of dollars trying to open an establishment. And then I get, I, I won't be able to get a license in there because of a, a, a setback rule. How do we work through that? That's a great question. Joey, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so Mark, as we've discussed, I think there's no pre or conditional approval for any location. Um, so the city won't pre or conditionally approve the location for licensure. What you would have to do is submit an application. It would have to be reviewed. The location would have to be reviewed for proximity. And then we would schedule that public hearing at that time, generally about that time. And there are some nuances in this process and unique cases all the time. Um, but at that time is when we would say that you had submitted your application, we'd reviewed it for completion, um, it met the, the rules of the proximity restrictions, and if a childcare facility or a school opened after your public hearing, during your inspection process, I believe, and we can check with the city attorneys on this, but I believe that you would continue to be able to pursue your licensure at that location, but you have to have an application that's active. So if the location that you're talking about is in a neighborhood of undue concentration. At the time of your application, if that is a neighborhood of undue concentration, we can't issue a license there. If at the time of your application, there is a school or a childcare facility within, uh -huh. that, we can't issue a license there. And um, Reggie, this is Reggie Newbun. I'm on here too. And Joey, you're right. And and I, I mean, the, the tough answer, Mark, is that we can't, there are no assurances and that's what you're describing is something that can happen today, right? Like a person could be investing a lot of money into a building, getting an application ready and a school opens up right next door to them right the day before they apply and locks that application out. Generally the department looks at, looks at first in time um, as, as it relates to an application. So if you submit your application and nothing is, is too close to you, then we'll continue to process that application. Um, but, but yeah, you know, if, we, if you submit your application and we find that you're too close to something, then, then by law, we would have to deny it. Right, right, okay. okay. I didn't know Reggie was on the call. I just didn't want to be in trouble. <laughs> <Reggie>? <laughs> All right, what a tempted to rush. <laughs> I very deeply appreciate Reggie being here. <laughs> well, and, and if I can just elaborate and then I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. If, so it's my understanding that based on the conversations today, the social equity applicant should already be in the state applying for that approval. But my understanding is the problem with that is they won't approve it unless you have a location. That's what I've been told, at least by council. So that's, you know, it's really tough to we can ask navigate with both city and state here so so i know we have casey and travis on on the line um at the med and i don't think that the finding of suitability does require that location or that business license application i i think that a social equity applicant can submit their finding of suitability without that information but i'm not sure hi joey i can jump on this is casey um so i'm with the marijuana enforcement division and Yep, you're absolutely correct, Joey. There is no requirement to have a location or uh, really a business model or anything yet when you submit your application for um, your finding of suitability for social equity. Once you are submitting your application for the actual uh, business license, that's when you do need to have 
a location identified. And, and for answering. Um, all right, Jennifer E, I think you were next, and then we'll go to Dwayne and then QC. Jennifer? Jennifer, you are muted. Okay, we'll come back to Jennifer. Um, Dwayne, do you wanna go ahead? Hey, what's going on guys? What's up, Joey? You doing? Dwayne Petra Lounge. Um, I pretty much had a similar question to Matt about um, licensing. I put in my owner suitability application this week and pretty much moving forward. Uh, my main question, will the hospitality license be available June 1st for the city of Denver? Or should I kind of base my application on something similar to that the state is? So for hospitality licenses, we are looking at a, uh, a timeline of potentially November for those licenses to be available for application at the city. Um, that's because uh, we're moving all of our license applications online. And so in the meantime, um, we have some manual processes we can do for licenses that exist currently, but for those hospitality licenses, um, they'll be part of the online process. And so they require a bit more implementation time um, and a bit more training for our staff and for our inspectors. And so um, we are looking at uh, a tentative timeline of November for those licenses to be available. And we had uh, like, well, we have guidelines for properties, like security requirements, things like that, prior to that? Yeah, so we uh, are aligning with the state's rules for marijuana hospitality establishments for the most part. So um, I think the best place to start is reading the state rules uh, for marijuana hospitality businesses. Um, those security requirements, we're aligning for the most part with all of that. Um, I, off the top of my head, I didn't think of additional requirements for hospitality that would apply to security or, or to the actual building itself. Um, but if you have specific questions about, you know, your business or what you're looking at, we can, we can connect offline. Yeah, I already have uh, blueprints and stuff made. I've been here a year or so. Um, I want to look at the, kind of more the academic, economic and space development for my area as well, so. Great. But thank you. We'll reach out anytime, Dwayne, and we can connect. We can we can get an hour on the books or something and, and talk about any other questions you might have specific about, um, you know, security stuff. Yeah, because I definitely, I know I need to work on, like, just, just basic zoning and stuff with you guys to kind of be prepared for that timeline. So I definitely want to everything you know my ducks in a row like three years ago <laughs> <laughs> sounds good All okay right, thank, you. thank you uh jennifer are you um ready to ask your question okay can you hear me now yes yeah. okay awesome sorry about that um, okay, so my name is Jennifer, and I'm interested in, um, oh no, you cut out, Jennifer. Ugh, we lost her. Okay, I'm going to move on, and then Jennifer hopefully can get reconnected to audio, um, or feel free to send us an email at marijuanainfo at denvergov.org, Jennifer, and we can connect offline. Uh, Shannon, it looks like you're next. Hey, I'm Shannon Bustos. Um, hey, I have a question on the eligibility criteria. So the number one um, applicant resides in a disproportionately impacted area. How exactly do I verify that, I guess? Do I just contact the 
is there a place that I contact or, or how do I go about verifying? That's a, an excellent question, Shannon. Um, the MED actually has a tool where you can um, type in your address and it will tell you if you live in a disproportionate impacted area or, um, or a opportunity zone. So, and that would be the address that you lived between 1980 and 2010. So any of those addresses that you wanna try. Um, that tool can tell you. Um, okay. It, and actually, then, oh, sorry. Uh, and then how do I, how would I um, just prove, I guess, that I lived there? If it was, because it, it would be around 1980. Um, so um, I guess going back that far, how, how would I prove that I was in that area for 15 years? Casey, is that a question you could so this yeah, is Danielle. I, mean, I can. Oh, Danielle. Yeah, okay, oh, okay. <laughs> so you can submit school records, um, utility payments, such, things like that. There's also, we want to get as much information as possible to support your application. You can also submit a, a statement from somebody who knew you during that time with contact information for that person. But the more documentation you have to support that, the better. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to quickly, cause I think this is a good opportunity to show, um, just share my screen and show the, uh, MEDs social equity, marijuana enforcement division, social equity webpage. Um, so it's, uh, sbg.colorado.gov slash social equity. And if you scroll down, it has the social equity criteria and then some eligibility tools. So um, you can click here and it'll take you to a map. Um, and you can type in your address in the address bar. And it takes a second to load. This is the address of the Wellington Web Building. <laughs> so if we zoom out, it should show that uh, that's in a, I think, disproportionate impacted area. Abby, just yeah. one note on that. If you click on those top, on, on the top right corner on those three pieces of paper, um, that's the layer list. And I think you can check the opportunity zones as well, because I don't think the opportunity zones pre-populate. Let's see. It's not... So hmm. if that comes up, um, I think <laughs> in general, I think the map auto, auto checks the disproportionate impacted areas, but not the opportunity zones. And then Shannon, I just sent you an email with a link to this webpage. Okay, thank you so much, Joy. Okay, um, QC, Q exclamation point C is the screen name. Do you wanna ask a question? Yeah, hi, this is Quanisha um, and I'm, uh, I'm interested in the uh, mobile retail and then the retail marijuana hospitality business license, the mouthful. Um, but with that, I'm just wondering, with us pairing with the people who are already in the cannabis business, like what is the buy-in for them? Like I know we, you went through all the red flags, like be alert, be like, don't let these people take advantage. Um, but what is it so that they don't take advantage? Can I ask that? Like, what are we giving them? Like, is it later down the road they get priority on, you know, when Colorado opens up completely? Like, do they get priority? Do they get tax breaks? Do they get something so that I'm not even, you know, like, so that I'm not like, being taken advantage of, right? That's a good question. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're asking what's what's the incentive for an existing marijuana business to invest in a social equity business or, or partner with a social, social equity applicant? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, I don't wanna speak on behalf of the industry, so I might punt to Truman if he's willing, but um, there's no formal incentives uh, from the government side other than um, that social equity applicants have exclusive access to 
uh, licenses for stores, transporters, uh, manufacturing facilities, cultivations, and then the hospitality and hospitality and sales licenses. And so, and, and also the exclusive ability to do deliveries for stores. So in your example, you're interested in a hospitality business potentially. If anyone in the marijuana industry currently would like to expand their footprint into the hospitality sector of this industry, um, they would have to partner with a social equity applicant to do that. So I guess that's sort of the natural incentive is that if you want to expand your footprint in Denver anymore as an existing business, you would have to do that by investing in a social equity applicant's business. And then the terms of that agreement are, are private terms of an agreement. So whether that's that the business gets to put their brand on your business or there's sort of a co-branding effort, but you're the actual owner of the business and in control of it, um, there could be other arrangements in place, but I think there's no formal incentive. There's no tax credits or anything like that. It's more just that licensing exclusivity piece. So I don't know if Truman wants to jump in. I don't want to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy to. Thanks. Appreciate that. And um, QC, good luck um, with your business. <laughs> I think it sounds awesome. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons why uh, businesses would be interested in partnering, both um, existing cannabis businesses, as well as just straight um, you know, financiers, entrepreneurs, people who uh, may not have the, the know-how or are capable or interested in putting in the sweat that you're going to be putting in. I mean, business relationships form for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, you know, there's, there's time, there's treasure, there's knowledge, there's, there's all of those different things. And so, you know, who knows, maybe it's a mobile tasting room for lots of different, um, you know, businesses who need exposure, right? It's really hard to do, to do marketing in this industry. And so, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why both existing players might be inter interested in partnering with you or whether it would be kind of a, a new person coming in, right? And that's up to you in terms of, you know, what what each person brings to the table. And, you know, a lot of business relationships work out and, and some don't get off the ground because people can't agree. But, you know, I think it sounds like you've got a lot going on. And so I definitely wouldn't sell yourself short. Nice, thank you. Um, and my last question being, um, so, you went over how the transportation and delivery with the dispensaries, they're going to get their license. It will open it up for the people holding the license. So how do I, I don't know, I guess like you're not a fortune teller, right? But like, how do I know that people are not already monopolizing on the fact that like dispensary A already knew this was coming. So they've prepared a team of people who, you know what I mean? Like, how do we know that we're not getting locked out just so it looks good on paper that we applied and they already had their team? If you can answer that, I don't want to be like, you know, crazy. No, that's a good question. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're kind of asking, how do we avoid being boxed out by stores who already have an advantage are already existing and they have been planning for this. I think the answer is that it's, I mean, that's a tough question. I think the idea behind the policy is that stores will be able to get their delivery permits and, and hopefully get them soon because the delivery permit allows them to supply product to the transporter to deliver to, to consumers. So there has to be stores that have delivery permits in order for transporters to take product from them to the consumer. Um, the fact that there might be a lag in transporters getting delivery permits, I think that's just a natural course of how this is potentially gonna go. But once there's kind of a mass of transporters that have delivery permits, I think there'll start to be contractual relationships with the stores and then the stores supply the product and the transporters deliver it. But the idea behind the policy was that for, th for the first three years, only transporters can do those deliveries for stores. So the stores can't do their own deliveries to consumers until July 1st, 2024. So hopefully that incentivizes them to work with transporters to do their deliveries for those first three years. And then they don't have the opportunity to do the deliveries direct to the consumer before transporters can get off the ground. 
Joey, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I, I just want to make sure. Um, I think what you're asking is if a store, if a store had kind of said, "I see this as an opportunity," so we're going to identify a social equity licensee because ultimately, in order for a transporter to conduct those deliveries, they have to be a social equity licensee to get the delivery permit. So the store would have had to identify someone. They would have had to go through the. They'll have to go through the same process of of licensing. Uh, their transportation businesses. They'll have to receive the delivery permit. And then all of the associated costs with that in terms of the vehicle requirements. So having to own or lease the vehicles, um, all of the video surveillance. Um, I think it's, it's possible kind of what you've described. Um, I think it, it may make more sense for stores to find partners who are social equity transporters who have independent businesses to run those deliveries for them um, because it'll be, uh, there'll be a, a little bit of um, the ability to be removed from some of those other operational challenges or, or, um, or costs, at least for the next three years. So I think what you've described is, is certainly possible. I don't, I anecdotally based on what we've kind of been hearing from folks in the industry, um, I think there is a desire to partner with social equity licensees and so I don't think that's going to be the overwhelming majority of our stores um, looking for those kinds of, um, of, you know, alternative paths to delivery. And I think, or from my Thank experience, um, I work with a few dispensaries now, and I see a lot of dispensary owners that I know personally um, looking within their company because they, everyone understands the social equity owner has to own 41%, but they are targeting people that are in the industry that fit the social equity platform to kind of offering some of those training uh, costs and things going forward. Thanks for that perspective, Dwayne. Um, Jose, I think you're next. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. My name's Antonio, actually. It's my son's outlook. Um, <laughs> coronavirus, you know how that goes. Um, so my question has to do more with the uh, delivery compliance. Um, since we are going to be delivering and getting orders from hopefully dispensaries, and they're going to be pushing out the orders, um, it has to do with the actual situsing of the locations. Who, is, is there going to be like a lookup tool or some kind of hold harmless location in case we do deliver to something that's on the border of somewhere else that isn't allowing these type of deliveries and who's gonna be liable for that. And then I have another question too. That's a great question. I'm actually gonna ask our state partners if they have an answer to that. Um, the question just being, how will delivery businesses sort of know if they're delivering into an area that's um, potentially off limits, like a college campus or um, like, boarding a parker or something exactly sure. yeah. into a jurisdiction that that doesn't allow delivery hey, this is casey again um we've definitely discussed it but we don't have anything in place right now i can make note of it and we can definitely um, talk more about it with our leadership team um, to see what we can do to uh, assist that issue to not be an issue <laughs> No, perfect. That works out. And then my second question is, is there a cool down period for, because uh, I used to work at the state not too long ago, and I was in a like enforcement position. Is, it, is there a cool down period before I can actually apply for my licenses? There's no cool down period on our side. So we wouldn't be looking at anything like that. I think that's just something that you might have to check on with your former employer and just make sure that, that they don't have any sort of cooling off period, but it's not something that we would uh, be looking at. Perfect, thank you. Ari? Hi, thank you. Um, the state social accelerator program, I didn't hear that mentioned at all on this call. I don't know if there'll be a separate call on that. Um, will that be taking effect in Denver as well in the beginning of June or will there be a delay around that? 
Is that something that's going to be happening in Denver as well, the accelerator program and applications around that for businesses to partner with social equity applicants? Yes. So we don't have a particular Denver accelerator program. Uh, there wasn't really um, sort of a local licensing piece of that. So it's, it's really just more of a state program. But we, if you were to have um, somebody who wanted to open a, an accelerator business within an accelerator endorsed business or as a separate premises, um, they would still have to apply to the city for that type of business license. So it's not a specific accelerator store license. It would just be a, a, a typical store license that would go through our our normal processes. So we would be able to do a store within a store, let's call it accelerator in Denver by going through the normal process. A store within a store or a cultivation within a cultivation or a manufacturing facility within a manufacturing facility. Reggie, I think we, to the extent that it would be allowed by state law, is there an allowance for the shared premise model of the accelerator program? Not sure if he caught me. We might have to take that one to our city attorneys then. Okay. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, oh. So yeah, the, to the extent that the state um, would let you share your premises, the city would, would let you share your premises, would let that sharing of premises happen as well. So we would need to take a look at the, the state code and probably work with the state to make sure that that, that actually could happen. Um, but if, if, if the state code would allow for it, um, our regulations would allow for it as well. Okay. And in the application process, when those new applications come out, will that be available to apply for right at that time? Or is the only you, option to apply for your own store? You would apply, so if you apply for a, an accelerator license for a store with the state, you would need to get a regular store license with the city um, to, to match those two together. Okay. But all the requirements around the actual facility would be applicable to the store that you're operating within, correct? You might just need new POS and new camera, but basically the facility requirements, if the store is compliant that you're operating within, then technically your physical location would be compliant, correct? That's a good question that I think we would need to probably kind of look at. Um, you know, answering just off the top of my head, I would think that both those store licenses are, are separately licensed and they would need, they would need to meet separate requirements. Um, but I think we would need to, to think through that um, and, and look at how some of these, these types of businesses are planning on operating. And because really it's going to get down to, to some questions about liability and, and, and who is responsible for the actions at at and on those premises. So I think that's a good question that you're asking already, but um, I think that's one that we're just gonna need to think about before we can provide you with, with an answer for it. But you, you guys will be able to provide an answer. Will, will there be another call around this or can I maybe schedule a time with one of you guys to discuss this or ladies? That might be that might be the best idea, yeah, to, to okay. probably talk about it online, offline um, after we've, we've kind of got a working idea about what some of these might look like, especially with the accelerator licenses. Excellent. Okay, cool. I appreciate that. Thank you all. Um, okay, we have, oh, we just hit seven o'clock, but I wanna see if Jennifer was able to reconnect to audio and see if you wanna ask your question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Awesome, third time's a charm. Sorry about that. You'd think I never did a Zoom call. <laughs> uh, my name is Jennifer, and I am interested in opening a hospitality business. And with your requirements on location, I had a question. Um, it says a thousand feet from same license type. That would mean a hospitality license type, correct? It wouldn't mean a marijuana business or uh, such as a retail marijuana uh sales or medical marijuana sales, or does that include a same type? Correct. So the 1000 foot buffer between hospitality businesses is just between hospitality businesses, um, not between hospitality businesses and a store or another different license type. Okay. So it'd be okay to be near one of those. Okay. Thank you so much. That was my question. Sure. 
Uh, Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, I was actually going to pass it to Beatrice. I think she raised her hand first. But um, if you could just tell me about finding of suitability in Denver. If I was already approved by the state, but my suitability is focused on Aurora, would I need to do a whole new finding of suitability application for Denver? Or, yeah, it sounds... Nope. Your finding of suitability at the state level is valid uh, in any jurisdiction. So we'll accept the state's finding of suitability regardless. <laughs> Beatrice, did you have a question? Yeah, I just had a real quick question. I apologize. Uh, I was actually at work and so I couldn't put my, my face on. But I did want to, um, I just wanted to verify. You did say that the um, transporter license would not be issued until June? So applications will become available in June for the transporter license, but we can't, um, per the ordinance, we can't start issuing those licenses until July 1st. Oh, I see. So we do apply in June for that license to be issued in July. Is that correct? You can, you can okay. apply um, when those applications become available in June, but there's no time, there's no time limit. So you could apply okay. November or December or whenever you're ready. Okay, and then I just wanna reiterate on, if I'm understanding this correctly, say I was to get the transporter license, did you say that a, an existing, um, dispensary has to wait three years before they can actually apply for a transporting um, sales license? So the existing dispensary um, can get a delivery permit and must get a delivery permit in order to use a transporter to do their right. deliveries to consumers. Right. But the store themselves can't do the deliveries to consumers for three years. So until oh, okay. 2024, it's kind of confusing because um, the store and the transporter both have to have a delivery permit, even if the store isn't doing their own deliveries, even if they're just using a, a transporter, they still just have to have that delivery permit. But right. in Denver, okay. they just won't be able to do their own deliveries for three years. Okay, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear. <laughs> So the dispensary can't do their own delivery for three years, but if a transporter has their license, say this year, I'm just giving an example, um, the then, morning, but then they would be able to, uh, how would they would be able to try to transport for a, a dispensary if they have to wait that three year period as well? Or is that, what they'd have to do, I guess is what I'm asking. They would have to wait three years before they could actually uh, transport any uh, product from a dispensary to a customer? So the transporter can only get marijuana from a, a dispensary to, okay. to the consumer. So the transporter can start doing deliveries as soon as they have their permit, but they have to get that product from the store. They can't get it from anywhere else. So the store is really the one that's making the sale and then right. they pass the product to the transporter and the transporter takes it to the customer. How much is okay. it for the transporter to have the permit? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. How much is it for the transporter to have a permit? You have to pay for the permit and register with the state, right? Right. Yeah. How much is the, the permit for that? The fee, I believe it's about 5,400 or 5,600, I think it was. So the fee for a delivery permit for social equity applicants is $2,000. That's an annual fee. Well, and then okay. there's no application fee for social equity applicants. Um, the state fee, I can't speak to the state fees, so I don't know if um, someone from NED yeah. would chime in. But then, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's just for the delivery permit. For the transporter permit, um, the license fee for social equity applicants is uh, $1,500 for a medical marijuana transporter license, and then $2,500 for a retail marijuana transporter license, but that $2,500 is waived for the first year. 
So oh, there's a transporter license and a permit. So there are two, two identifications that are required. Right. So a transporter license allows you to do business to business transport. Um, but then if you add a delivery permit on top of it, you can do uh, business to business transport and you can do delivery to marijuana consumers. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, okay. so- I think I understand, thank you. Uh, you did answer my question or it did get okay. answered that. I appreciate that, thanks. Great. So we are uh, six minutes over time. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, close out the meeting, but thank you all so much for attending. It was uh, great to see some familiar faces and some new faces. We're really excited to uh, get this program up and running and um, continue to be in contact with you all. Um, as I stated before, if you have questions about your specific situation or just additional questions that come up after tonight, um, please reach out to marijuanainfo at denvergov.org and that'll get your message to either Joey or myself and we can connect offline. Um, and this recording and the slides will be posted online uh, sometime soon. And we're having another info information session on Thursday at noon. Um, so if you have other folks who might be interested in attending or if you wanna sit through our presentation one more time, you're welcome to on Thursday. Um, so thanks Thank everybody. you as well. Have a great thank evening. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night.